So good evening, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> um, all day I've been uh, losing my reading glasses, so today I have them. There we go. Good evening, uh, and welcome to uh, the Martin Siegel, Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. My name is Margaret Edwards, and I'm a sixth-year doctoral uh, candidate in the theater and performance program. And I'm senior program associate uh, here at the Martin E. Siegel uh, Theater Center. And first, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the, the uh, Siegel uh, Center, uh, whose mission it is to bridge the worlds of academia and the arts, and its director, um, Dr. Frank Henschker, um, for the opportunity to organize this event. Um, the, um, uh, I'd also especially like to thank uh, the Siegel crew and staff who have helped me immensely uh, to do this. Also, special thanks goes to uh, Martin Ruck and Z. Dempster at the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean, IRADAC for short, um, for their support of this event. Uh, also, the Theater and Performance Program and our EO, Peter Eckersall, the Doctoral Student Council, and the Doctoral uh, Theater Students Association. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the group of artists and scholars who have uh, ag agreed to generously join us and share in this conversation. So first things first, cell phones. Let's turn them off together. You know, airplane mode. I always do airplane mode. Done. So, I noticed uh, as I was preparing the publicity materials for this event that I kept toggling between African dance dramaturgies, how we represent and how do we represent. On being, one being a declaration, an affirmation of a set of, a clear set of dramaturgical goals and accomplishments, the other a query about the nature of an Africanist aesthetic criteria in African and African diaspora concert dance. Well, both are applicable here. 
This event is meant to be an affirmation of not just one kind of Africana dance dramaturgy, but many. And most importantly, a query into what that means and what those dramaturgies might be. By dramaturgy, I mean the process by which ideas and cultural and political imperatives are transformed into theatrical practice, in this case, theatrical dance practice. This, of course, includes the choreographies, the movement, vocabularies, the role of performers, the uh, costuming, the sets and the lighting, the engagement with the audience. But it also includes histories and genealogies invoked within the theater theatrical space, the social, political, and spiritual concerns that confront the creators of these works, and the question of collaboration. How do we work with our collaborating artists? The dancers, the musicians, the designers, the producers, the presenters, publicity departments, critics, collaborators, all. In the early 1930s, Asadara de Fora declared a, needed, declared a need for an authentic representation of African culture on Western theatrical stages. He then created what could arguably be called the first African concert dance event on US stages in Kikunkor, or The Witch Woman, in 1934. An African dance artist living in the US created for his audience a work of art that for him addressed the misrepresentation of Africa to the world. He called it an African folk opera. Later, during the anti-colonial and independence periods in West Africa, philosopher revolutionaries like Amilcar Cabral and Franz Fanon understood the centrality of culture and specifically African dance and music traditions to the transformation from the colonial condition to the formation of an independent national identity and pan-African consciousness. Significant political leaders like Kwame Nkrumah and Leopold Sedar Senghor consequently supported and established national art centers, training programs, and national theaters meant to reclaim traditional indigenous art forms and place them in dialogue with Western modernity. Dance artists like Fodi Baketa in Guinea, established Le Ballet Africain, and Maurice Sonar Senghor uh, founded Le Ballet Af uh, National de Senegal, to name a few. There are many more. Uh, and many of these national dance companies succeeded in their mission to share the richness of African artistic practices and circulated around the world throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, bolstering a diasporan black arts movement in the US, the Caribbean, South America, and Europe. Since that time, there have been artists stretching established parameters, paradigms of representations of Africa by Africans and African-blooded people. Thank you, Andre, for that phrasing. Germaine Cogni, Senegalese dancer, choreographer, and teacher, considered the mother of African modern dance, began her work in 1962, which if you were here for the earlier film, she said that's when it began for her, when she was able to make connections to the technique of European ballet and the techniques of African dance. Founder of Mudra Afrique with Maurice Beja in the 1970s and now founder of Ecole des Sables in Tubab Dielao in Senegal. Uh, and in the early 2000s, contemporary African choreographers and companies have been transforming and upending expectations of audiences and critics, challenging categorizations and exploding assumptions about authorship, audience expectations, and frameworks of the modern, the contemporary, and the traditional. I have invited a group of artists here today, and I'm so honored that they've agreed to be here, uh, to share their approaches to dance making that considers this notion of African dramaturgies, a term that represents a multiverse of creative approaches from the continent and the diaspora. Tonight, we ask, what considerations must African and African diaspora artists contend with when approaching a new work or revisiting a traditional choreography? What distinguishes work based in tradition? How does subject matter shape the engagement with the audience? What strategies are employed when confronted with these legacies? And to what degree are these strategies politically, economically, or historically driven? How do these concerns collectively represent African dramaturgies? So we will begin with my friend uh, uh, and uh, choreographer, musician, uh, uh, and teacher. Uh, Olivier Tarpaga of the Baker Tarpaga Dance Group. Olivier recently premiered his newest work, When Birds Refuse to Fly, as part of the Crossing the Line Festival, sponsored by, the, by FIAF, the French Institute Alliance Francaise, this past October. He is fresh off the tour and will share his dance making process with us. Following uh, Olivier's talk, we will have the pleasure 
of talking with a group of dance artists and scholars whose work has also been exploring the multi-voiced interdisciplinary practice of Africana concert dance for many years. We'll have uh, Funmi Adewole, who's a dramaturg um, in the UK. She'll be on Skype joining us a little bit later, uh, giving us uh, the European-African uh, kind of connection and um, uh, landscape. Uh, we'll have Andre M. Zachary, Rosamund S. King, Charmian Wells, and Abdel Salam in a roundtable discussion. We will then open the discussion to you, the audience, and welcome to this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Olivier Tarpaga. Okay, good evening, everybody. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Margaret. It's uh, exciting to be here. Um, my name is Olivier Tarpaga, and I was born and raised in uh, Burkina Faso. Um, uh, my work is uh, contemporary dance theater. It's hybrid. Um, the, the thing to understand with me is uh, I'm as traditional and as contemporary you can ask for. Um, I, it, it was extremely important to me as an artist to remember that if I didn't have this strong base of West African dance and music, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today that is kind of exciting and unique to some audiences everywhere. <clears throat> so I try to remind, re remind myself uh, and remind people. So that's why everywhere I go teach through my negotiation is if you're getting me two classes, one has to be traditional, one has to be uh, hybrid or contemporary. So then you see uh, the approach that I have and what informs uh, what I do and who I am today. Uh, so the, also the, 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 the other thing I try to do that I always tell students, I say uniqueness creates opportunity. You know, the thing is you don't have to be the best in the world, but when you try to approach something in a unique way, you create uh, something uh, different and you create a whole market for yourself. <clears throat> so as a musician also, a traditional musician who's also open to world music, working with musicians from India, Indonesia, and gamelan, and tablas, and, and rock, and uh, Hollywood, and all these things, is uh, also something that extremely informed my approach into contemporary dance making and traditional uh, dance and music. Uh, making because yes, you can still compose in traditional music. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about three different works um, uh, from my repertory that are really dear to me that I think will uh, play well into the subject of dramaturgy and African uh, uh, dance making. Uh, I'm going to start with this piece, Declassified Memory Fragment, that I started. This is the longest piece of. It took me five years to make this piece. <clears throat> One, because of the logistic issues of living in the United States, traveling back to Burkina. 99% of my works are made in Burkina Faso. Since I lived in this country for almost 18 years, all my works are made in Burkina Faso. I go back there, I find the artist from there, I make it there, and I find a way to bring it here and then take it to places. Because they understand my movement, they understand my person, they understand my strategy. I know how they move, I understand where they go. Then it's easy for me to take them to places. So that is my uh, approach to how I'm able to make the kind of work I make today. I can make it anywhere, but at certain level, it was important for me to go back and reconnect uh, there uh, with the land. This piece in particular, I'm gonna show you uh, a, a, a section. The classified memory fragment uh, was an urgency for me uh, because, you know, I, I'm a 41 year old young man. My face looks way younger than that. Uh, yes, that's true. And I love that I'm going to live even longer. Yes, I like when they say, You look young. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and in someone born in 1978, um, I lived through a coup in 1980. 
I lived through a coup in 1983. I lived through a coup in 1987 where I almost died uh, because I was riding a military camp playing soccer when they killed the president two blocks from there and they attacked the camp and I was there, I was just a young boy. I lived <clears throat> through the, um, the regime change in 2014 of the most powerful, most little president of West Africa, Blaise Compaore, who was president for 27 years, who changed the constitution five times in order to change the republic and so that he can keep running from seven years twice to after that changing the republic to uh, five years and he ran twice and then he wanted to change it again to four years so that we can say, okay, you can start over. Uh, how did we get him out of power? Because um, two friends of mine, musicians, uh, one reggae musician and one uh, rapper uh, said no. And then uh, a few, a choreographer friend of mine, Serge Eme Koulibaly, and a few of us mobilized people through our work and through uh, the internet. And then because the opposition was uh, corrupt easily, they would go out and scream, yeah, yeah, we don't accept this, get out. And then they would get a big bag and then they would zip it. Then the problem is when they started attacking all of my musician friends, bombing their, their houses, the military didn't understand dance because for them dance is nothing because we're not people. So they don't go see our dance performances. They didn't really care. So we started creating work that had stronger meaning politically. So the audience will come, soldiers will never come there. Then through uh, uh, pre-show discussion, the peace, and post-show post discussion, people, even people who doesn't understand contemporary dance were able to get out with something and were able to mobilize people on the ground through contemporary dance and hybrid uh, work that we have been doing. So, and so one of my participation was this piece, the classified memory fragment, because I think that for my young age, my memory is completely fragmented with all of these things I've, uh, I had to live through, which doesn't make sense for a country that they call the land of upright people, a country so rich in culture, but what is happening politically is so inflammatory that now that we're even stable politically, it's just uh, jihadists from Mali landing in Burkina and bombing it every time. So that is the next project I have to work on. That's my, uh, my approach to situation. So uh, I went to Kenya, <clears throat> with a choreographer called uh, Opio Okash, unbelievable human being, to do a research in 2010 about what happened in 2007 after my Kibeki, President Kibeki, uh, ran for re-election against Raila Odinga. <clears throat> and so when President Kibeki uh, kind of won re-election, uh, I think under the table Odinga won the elections. So what happened is he invited Raila Odinga to become prime minister, saying that be my number two, let's go to peace, and let's not go to war. And so he accepted to be prime minister instead of president. And then, <clears throat> uh, people, before that happened, people started killing each other. So I have friends of mine that are dancers, they're neighbors of 30 years, who will knock at the door and say, like, hey, how are you doing? I'm sorry, man, I gotta do this. And then machetes, people started getting cut everywhere. The person you drink tea with every day because this guy's not from my ethnic and politics, right? Then in the Ivory Coast, in, uh, in, the early, in 2002, a problem happened between President Gbagbo and then uh, this young leader of the north of, of Ivory Coast, um, which is, um, I have to remember his name, who became prime minister because of the war and then he wanted to get the power and then he invited him to become uh, a prime minister. Then it happened to Zimbabwe with Mugabe and, and, uh, and, 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 and Morgan Shangarai. Then I was telling myself, this is becoming uh, a routine where you could win an election and, some, and, 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 and so the, the guy who was sitting on the power will say, look, if you don't want war, just become number two, and then we'll move on. As a dancer, I told myself, I have a responsibility towards society 
to do something significant. So I'm going to make a piece. And then something that is urgent that I need to scream about what is happening to our memory. What, are we, what kind of traces we're leaving behind. So as a choreographer, what can I do? People don't understand dance. Even dancers don't understand contemporary dance. How do you do that? Dramaturgy is the key. How do you approach the dance in a way that people, even when they don't, get, they don't get it really well, they won't just go out and say the movements are good, they can interpret some moment and say like, okay, I, I see why you did it that way. So that is why I work with dramaturgs all the time. Since then, I was like, it has to get there in order to make sense, in order to approach. And, and so that even dancers understand why I'm doing that. Even my own dancers will go and dance hard, but they don't always get why I did it that way and where I'm going. That's when the dramaturg was always going to come and make things make, make sense. And sometimes it's challenging for me, too, because he would question everything. So <clears throat> this dance, I wanted it to talk about why two people are sharing power when this power is supposed to be one person. Uh, uh, Mbagbo from the Ivory Coast, the president, say, this is a presidential uh, chair. It's not a presidential bench. So we can't have two people sitting on the bench. It's not a bench, it's a chair. So then in order for me to, to, to bring that on stage, my own approach, I use two, two people dancing in one suit. There was one suit. One guy is dancing, he took up the suit, and one guy ran and went inside the suit. And then the two were stuck in the suit, and then the whole choreography happened with two people stuck in one regular size suit. And how do you make them dance without messing up the suit, or without tearing apart? So that was a challenge. So the first idea of the piece is like, why is the thing with people calling other people to share the power, knowing they don't want them to be sitting there? When people are out of the meeting, the whole government, these two guys cannot look at each, each other on the, in, in the face. That's how I carried up that part, because of the suit. So someone who doesn't understand the story will not know that I'm talking about this politics uh, situation in the continent, but they can have an interpretation that these are two people fighting for one thing. And so that's my approach sometimes to how I make sense to, how my dance can make sense to uh, subjects that I, I approach. So I'm gonna show you one part of the piece that I didn't wanna only talk about sad Africa, crying Africa, problem Africa, coup d'etat Africa, because it's not the case. But I needed to have responsibility and do something about it. Because if I'm not my own critic, then I'm lost. So through doing that, I showed places of the continent. The beginning of the piece, we have a part where we're all sitting on a motorcycle, modified, like completely um, uh, no wheels, but it's like the, <clears throat> the body of the motorcycle. Three people doing this dance, um, and then with the Adan, which is the Muslim prayer. Before I did that, I needed to, to ask Muslim leaders. I needed to go to the right places so that they understand that I want to use the Adan because when you hear the Adan, it's around four in the morning or five, there's always people on motorcycles with the whole family, seven people. So you have the mom, you have a kid behind, a kid in front, the dad, another adolescent kid here, and there's another kid. So it's just like kind of funny and cool, and some people will see that American way as dangerous. We see it as part of our daily life. So, but in order for me to represent that power, I needed that song there. Then, by also as a choreographer, you have a responsibility. So I approach leaders in the Muslim community, in order, and my dancers, some of them are Muslim, to know, do I have, I don't know if I have the right to use this. How do I do that? How do I represent this in uh, a respectful way? And till I got all my advices and I was able to use the Adan. So uh, I'm gonna show you a part where we dance and we went to a maquis, which is like a traditional open air bars in Burkina. Very positive, very crazy. I wanted people to see that Africa is actually more about these parts than the coups and the hap and the sadness and what CNN and Fox is saying about us. So that's one positive side of the piece. <clears throat>
So that was just uh, to see the transition of how we went to the Maquis in, uh, in, in Ouagadougou. And that's what you see in many capitals around uh, uh, the, the continent of Africa. So I'm, I'm gonna move quick to this one that is very dear to me. <clears throat> It's people who knows me as a contemporary choreographer will be surprised that I'm emphasizing this. This is a traditional dance piece because I go to so many, uh, I'm so fortunate to go to so many beautiful countries um, uh, to present my work, to create work, to teach. Um, and and it, 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 the frustration started building up in terms of what people think what African dance is. Um, and uh, so, I will uh, go and, and, and present the work and they'll be like, it, it, it's very African. And I was like, what do you mean that it's very African? Or, or sometimes I'll do something that's, that's very contemporary. I, I, I'm, I'm getting confused here. So what happened is after Declassified, I wanted to create this piece. To remind, remind myself, and remind, peop, re, remind people that I'm still a traditional artist. I'm a musician, I compose. At the same time, I'm a dancer. So I made this piece as a choreographer. And for people to see African dance on stage, like how do you stage it in a way and create a whole story so that, you know, if you respected me and you gave me the platform to be known or seen because of my contemporary work, guess what? Can I take that, that little privilege and show you the value of what traditional dance can be depending on how you put it on stage? So this was extremely important to me. And so there's a whole, it's a, it's a full length piece, it's one hour. <clears throat> this was actually commissioned by the Hong Kong Cultural, uh, World Cultural Festival in 2017. Uh, so, and it's a big piece, it's about 16 people on stage. And so I composed the music and, 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 and choreographed the, the dance, but I want you to see how the theatricality of how we started the beginning, the house of the, the, the king, uh, how the Mosi people, my ethnic group, my father's side, how do we go to the emperor's house? How, how the griot, what is the role of the griot, the actual role of that griot? He played the role of a griot on stage, which is a garden of the tradition. And this man never acted, but I told him to be a griot, and that's what he did. Through the song and through the staging, how the dramatists work in terms of showing traditional dance, for maybe a Western audience to understand and have a better approach to what we do and the value of what traditional is. So we, and so there's many dances for many uh, ethnic groups, but I'm gonna leave you a certain sections to see the beginning. Yeah. 
No time is flying, so this is. Uh, it was important for me to make this traditional work because I, I, I was tired that people are devaluating traditional work, maybe because of how it is shown on stage, or how it's not an excuse of being African or an excuse of having being shy or having a shame about how things look. No, but I had to think about how do you approach certain audiences, how do you, I won't say negotiate space, but how do you enter certain rooms in order to change people's approach and conception of what is African dance? And so some of the audiences that have seen my contemporary side, I wanted them to see that not for my own sake, but for the beauty and value of what is back there. So then I told myself, even home when I did that, People were really happy and they wanted the piece to be seen everywhere in this country. Why? Because I said, why do we, in contemporary dance, we have the tool manager, this, I have a rehearsal director, I, you know, I get the lighting designer, I get the fancy light and everything. But then none of my friends would never think about doing that for traditional dance. And I decided to put a lot of people on stage, give them the same um, uh, value of contract, the same way we do with contemporary dance, because I threw with traditional dance, I didn't get that. How do I value that through my character towards the people I work with? Change that med contract, give them the same possibility, the same conditions, put them in a nice theater, do lighting with a professional lighting designer, everything, the set designer, uh, with uh, dramaturgy, all of that, and that changed everything. Not that traditional artists have to do that, but I thought it was important for me to present that dramaturgically, for dramaturgy part, sorry my French, of my work to perhaps help certain people to give a bit more value into what, how beautiful and powerful traditional dance choreography can be. And so that's why I made this work. I thought it was important, I thought it was urgent. And then I'm really proud that this work was, this, the, was sold out every night for 2,200 seats every night, and the two pieces that were sold out is Yusundur and my piece, and I'm proud about that. Uh, <clears throat> and so the next, the last thing I'm gonna show you, it's the work um, that, the la my, my last latest work, which is the, um, uh, When Birds Refuse to Fly. I worked with a dramaturg that you know, uh, uh, Aristide Tarnagda, who's an amazing writer, <clears throat> um, uh, award-winning uh, uh, um, artist himself, and he is the director of the most important theater festival in the continent of Africa, La Recreatral. Every They will do a residency uh, in the year, and then they will go in a whole neighborhood, and all the works are happening in people's houses. So they will take somebody's 
we have, you know, not in, the U in New York with the apartment. People, everybody have a big a house with a big court, a courthouse. And then they will transform it as a theater. And, the la and last year, the president of the country came to see one of the shows because he understood how important it is. So they will transform a whole neighborhood. Presenters from all over the world will be there looking for new works. And so, and, and I was really lucky and fortunate to have him be the dramaturg of this piece. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna say one minute uh, information, information about it before I show it to you. Um, um, when Birds Refuse to Fly, it's a piece that is inspired by the music of my father's band from the 60s in, in Apo Volta, now Burkina Faso. Uh, when my, I lost my father in 2004, I was in New York uh, teaching at Connecticut Ballet and doing other stuff in New York. Uh, and then I flew home and my mother gave me a bag and said, okay, this is for you. I think he wanted you to have that. I knew what was in the bag. I refused to open the bag for 12 years. And, and, and I opened the bag in 2016 and then I find this old vinyl disc that I didn't know what to do with. It was so dirty and old. I went to, to Los Angeles to see a friend of mine who's a, a, a DJ. <clears throat> and then he cleaned it and, and we listened to the songs and no one was talking. He said, what are you gonna do with this? I said, okay, this is gonna, about to be my next project. How am I gonna connect to my father's music from the 60s? And they stopped playing music in 82, I was only four. I couldn't remember. How am I gonna to connect to that music from the 60s with my way of creating today? It started like that. As I listened to the songs, I told myself, wait a minute, this is bigger than my father and me trying to connect with him. I can hear James Brown in the music, I can hear Otis Redding, I can hear Marvin Gaye. I was like, his band was inspired by African-American music. If the band was inspired by African-American African -American music, I need to talk about the 60s if I wanna give justice to those songs. But if I talk about the 60s, I need to pay justice to the people who inspired my father's band to play that music. The 60s, the 60s was what, well, the 60s were post-independence fever in the continent of Africa. So which means in Sub-Saharan Africa, we were celebrating freedom and independence. But in the United States, that music was played for black liberation. While we were, talk, we were celebrating liberation, Black people in the United States were playing for black liberation. Then I told myself, I need to bring a balance into the story so that when people listen to that music, they try to find you know, a connection between the 60s in the United States and the 60s in the, in, in the continent of Africa. So, and that is why I also want to talk to, about the relationship between being African and African-American, something that people don't talk about that is extremely important. There's a, 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 an amazing relationship, the tough one and the beautiful one. So I target that and I try, try to, uh, and I made the work about uh, the, this relationship. And I'm gonna show you one section about what, uh, how I made that section is, when I watch movies, um, I'm inspired by, don't laugh at me, by war movies. I don't like war. But people who make war movies are very, very, very good at it. When I watch, every time I watch a movie or war movie, there's always a scene where you have thousands of people killing each other really hard, and you have a really slow music, maybe classical. So you wonder why they're putting this very nice string music and people are like, Wah! just look, in the middle there's always one person completely lost in the middle who's wondering what in the world am I doing here and thinking about his mommy or something like that. And there's always a moment when someone's gonna push him out of the screen, get out of here! And then they'll go back to that. That's what inspired me. Because as a composer also, I will have seven people going crazy and then you see that piece of music, you're like, why is it not related to that? No, it's the guy walking in the middle completely lost. That's the music is for this guy. That's my inspiration of how I create sections and how I think about, you know, uh, that don't go with this, slow don't go with slow, but sometimes you do that, but sometimes I love distance, I love opposite. So I'm gonna show you a section that it's a bit cine more cinematic for me, and it's a section that is inspired by my mother, as in the band she was so beautiful, everyone was in love with her, but uh, my father was the best one, so. <laughs> So uh, it's best for me to start with the transition of how I go to that scene. It's about six minutes, so and then after that, uh, we can. Uh 
This was in uh, Belgium uh, two weeks ago, I think so.
and stop here. Okay, thank you. Merci. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So we're going to transition now to the round table, uh, round semicircle. We'll put it mm -hmm. that way. Um, so we take a moment and, and, and stretch. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to ask each other questions and talk to uh, uh, other artists uh, for the next couple of minutes and bring in uh, Fumi Adewale from the from the UK, who's rubbing her eyes now as we wait for her. Uh, so yeah, we can bring the, bring the chairs out, and I'd like to invite. Uh, and scholars to come and join us. Um, join us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So joining us. Yeah. <clears throat> I could be on the mic. So joining us uh, for this roundtable uh, section, uh, including Olivier Tarpaga, uh, we will have Funmi Adewale from the UK, um, uh, 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 Rosamond S. King, please join the table, uh, is a critical and creative writer whose scholarly work focuses on sexuality, performance and literature in the Caribbean and Africa. Her book, Island Bodies, Transgressive Sexualities in the Caribbean Imagination, received the Caribbean Studies Association Book Award, and her research has been supported by the Fulbright, Ford, Mellon, Woodrow, and Woodrow Wilson Foundations. Her poetry includes a Lambda award-winning Rock Salt Stone, and she has performed around the world. Uh, uh, King is Associate Professor of English and Director of the Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College, part of the City University of New York. She is also co-chair of the Caribbean International Resource Network, President of the Organization of Women Writers of Africa, Creative Editor of Essex Salon, uh, and Performance Artist and Poet. Um, she has also worked as the dramaturg with, with our next guest, Andre M. Zachary. Uh, who is a Chicago-bred and now Brooklyn-based interdisciplinary artist, scholar, and technologist with a BFA from Ailey Ford University and MFA in Performance and Interactive Media Arts from CUNY Brooklyn College. As the artistic director of Renegade Performance Group, his practice, research, and community engagement artistically focuses on merging of choreography, technology, and black cultural practices through multimedia work. Andre is a 2016 New York Foundation for the Arts Gregory Millard Fellow in Choreography and 2019 Jerome Hill Foundation Fellow in Choreography. Our next uh, guest, uh, Charmian Wells, received her PhD in Dance Studies from Temple University at a, as a Presidential Fellow and a recipient of the Dissertation Completion Grant and the Edry Ferdin Scholarly Achievement Award. Her work examines articulations of queerness and diaspora in black arts movement concert dance in New York City, 1965 to 1975. This research stems from her performance career as dancer with Forces of Nature Dance Theater since 2006. She is on faculty at Sarah Lawrence and Lehman Colleges. Her writing has been published in Critical Correspondence and the Brooklyn Rail. She holds a BFA in dance and an MA in performance studies from NYU Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, and finally, um, Charmian, who, uh, work, who is a dancer with Forces of Nature, I'd like to invite uh, Abdel Salam uh, to the stage to join us. Uh, Abdel Salam, choreographer, director, producer, mentor, and educator. He has been active in the arts since 1955. In 1981, Abdel Salam, uh, Olabi Midele, her husband, and principal dancer Diane Harvey founded Forces of Nature Dance Theater Company, a New York City uh, based company, a fusion of traditional African dance, ritual dance, using ballet, modern dance, and hip hop. He is also the artistic director of Dance Africa. Dance Africa was founded by Baba Chuck Davis in 1977. Um, uh, uh, Baba Abdel Salam's um, biography <laughs> is longer than most of ours, so I will, <laughs> I will defer. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome, welcome you all uh, to this round table. Uh, oh, I guess we have one extra chair. Um, and there's, ah, there's Fumi, there's Fumi, hello. <laughs> so we're gonna start with, uh, with uh, Fumi Adewale. 
who is a dramaturg uh, in the UK. <laughs> and everyone's waving. Um, and uh, Fumi is going to kind of make a connection for us with the, with, um, the Europe and Africa dance landscape. Fumi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> There's a sort of delay over here. Hello, my name is Fumi Adwale. I really enjoyed listening to Olivier, Olivier's talk, uh, which was quite amazing and ties into a number of points I want to bring up. Um, when Mar Marguerite said I should um, contribute to this discussion, I thought very much about when the whole discussion about contemporary African dance started in um, England. I'm also Nigerian, and I visit Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, South Africa, and in England, as someone interested in contemporary African dance, so I go to France, I go to Belgium, and some other countries um, to, to see the work. In England, the debate started very much with the um, founding of the Contemporary Dance Competition. I think it was in 1985, 1995, and then there was a big debate about contemporary African dance and what it was. I've read the work of some critics saying that this was the beginning of contemporary dance in Africa. I would argue that it was not. However, it was, in my my point of view, the beginning of the industry. Because what it did is it mobilized artists, um, it gave from South Africa, West Africa, Central Africa to come together for this competition with European-based artists, um, African dancers based in Europe, and a few in America to come to this competition. And it, and it brought in presenters from around the world, and it um, made us dance sector before this, there were contemporary dance artists. We had Jamila Koyi, we had Zabma Bongo, people creating work between Africa and Britain, Peter Badijo, people of this elk. However, it hadn't been mobilized into a dance sector. That is very crucial because once that happened, the discourse about contemporary dance and theater, when it, um, and theater practice when it came, came to dance, it changed. Um, I would say in the 1940s, 50s, 50s, 60s, when the national ballet companies started, like the Ballet African de Guinea and the Ghanaian Dance Ensemble, which were two amazing and, uh, and companies which are still going, um, it was the time of independence. And at that time, the discourse was very different. It was almost an argument over African civilization. When um, Pietro Fuleba established Le Ballet Africain and brought, um, and brought it to Guinea from France. He was really arguing that Africa had a civilization and the positionality of the companies is, they were, they, it was almost like that these dance companies had, um, were facing the whole world and saying, this is Africa. And therefore the way African dance was staged at that time was to show this is Africa, this is Africa, Pre, um, pre, sometimes pre-colonial Africa, for example, and this is the beauty of African dance. When that was happening in the 50s, 60s, even down to the 70s, it was quite radical on the world stage. And I've read articles where many people were saying that this is a bastardization of African dance. How can you put it on stage? And uh, Kyoto Fonova was very political in his statement that this dance needs to be seen on the international stage because this dance holds the wisdom, and the music holds wisdom, the understanding of, of the African people. Coming into the 80s and 90s and 2000s, a lot of those styles of dances became more aligned to the music industry and the radicalism of putting traditional African dance on stage seemed to wane. And so, uh, and a lot of the independent, a lot of the uh, people working in modern African dance, it was called modern African dance or contemporary African dance, they were independent. They were independent artists. They didn't belong to uh, like companies like the National Ballet. We, because if you were in a National Ballet or a National Dance Company, you were a civil servant and you were on a salary. 
It's a different situation where you have individual choreographers trying to make work. And it was very hard for that generation, which broke the ground for contemporary dance, to get recognition internationally. So with the French-sponsored competition, this sector started and was galvanized. And I, so I would, I, would, I would credit that that competition started, that made the industry visible. And then um, some people say, oh, they brought the aesthetic. I would question that in, in the sense that, yes, they introduced, uh, the French introduced many aesthetics and many African dancers took them on. But you find that those that continued and made their companies, they started finding their own voices and started finding their own way and started using the networks they created to start creating platforms for their own work, go back to their own countries, create their own festivals, teach their own techniques, revisit traditional dance, learn it in a different way, transmit it in a different way. And um, I'm happy to be speaking after Olivier because um, his experience um, gives me a lot of examples uh, to this to explain what I see happening with a lot of contemporary African dance artists now. Um, what they do is that they're very aware, they're not approaching using dance as a way of um, fighting a political battle on, on the platform of politics. They do fight political battles but on the platform of art. So this is different. They approach the discourse differently and talk about their work very differently. So that's the difference. And it has, I think the way they talk about their work, it, you can't put them in this ethnographic box that they're only showing their roots. They are showing their roots, but they're also showing um, their position in the dance uh, discourse, how we talk about art. They also talk in an artistic language and not only in a political language. Um, they're uh, referring maybe to, uh, they might be interested in um, ideologies like Pan Africanism, but they will also speak in an artistic la language. So their positionality is very different. They're different. They're also very aware and they do address perception, you know. There's something that Olivier says, he goes into a room and he, he addresses the perception in a room. They're, they're very aware that they're part of an industry and that industry has a history of discourses as to what contemporary is, as to what tradition is. They have discourses and the artists are aware of these discourses and therefore address them by placing the context that they're speaking about in the work. So it's impossible to, to, in a way, unless you're blind, it's impossible to misinterpret what they're telling you. Um, they will put the scene in the work. They use objects very metaphorically, like, uh, like Olivia was talking about uh, the piece uh, in which he used a suit and two dancers dancing in the same suit. So the suit was the object representing several things. So it was, again, um, objects are used metaphorically. Also, Africa is not represented as one closed unit, um, a closed place. It, the complexities and levels and different connections of Africa to the outside world is represented. Uh, the, 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 uh, how the individual relates to society is represented. I mean, I was uh, very touched when um, Olivier was talking about his um, getting his father's records from 1980s and saying, what do I do this? And hearing African-American sound in his, his father's band and say, how do I show the connections of what was going on in Africa and what was going on with our connections with the diaspora and showing the relationship between what was going on in the nation in the 1960s, the euphoria of Africa, also the, the struggle uh, the, the struggle going on in America, how do I make all these connections in the piece? So it's not representing Africa like without any um, outside impact, but showing all these various layers. So there's the, um, uh, of the, the dramaturgy that the artists have developed um, shows this complexity of, of African culture. And I think 
I, I, um, some artists, what I find um, what in Europe, you know, they find that they find a voice very much within what we call live art. I think it's called more performance art in America. Some people find a voice more with uh, more on the sort of postmodern dance uh, sector, and they find a voice there. Some find a voice more with um, ballet, looking for fusions with ballet. So it's also very layered. The way contemporary African dance artists operate um, is to go into all these various scenes and work in a very dialogical math way, like having conversations with other artists. And I've seen a lot of artists using traditional performance in their work because they now speak about it and state it in a way that it's impossible just to look at it as something that is irrelevant or belongs to village and has, you know, hasn't got this depth. They bring the depth forward. I want to say um, one last thing because I, I get a sense that you know there's it's, it, it, we, you know there's other people to speak. So but I want to say one last thing, and um, that is about the concept of tradition. Um, I think the concept of tradition in, in, in Africa as a continent is very different from the idea of tradition in, in the West. Um, tradition, in, in a sense, is very contemporary. Um, this is my understanding. And most things that we call tradition have their beginnings in pre-colonial institutions in Africa. So let's say in, in, in the town I come from, which is Ilefe in, in, in Nigeria, in that town there are many festivals. Many of these festivals started way, way before colonialism and they continue today. So we see a lot of dance practices happening in these festivals. And we call them traditional dances. Some of these dances can change and evolve over time. They are still traditional because they operate in a traditional context. They are still performing a function that pre, uh, uh, pre existed colonialism, but they're contemporary in that they do absorb influences. Um, some new movements are introduced. So, and when new things happen in, in the country, they are sometimes reflected in the, in, in the dance. And so, uh, they're contemporary as well. So some people might see a modern dance form and they say, oh, is that really traditional? I would say, people in my belief would say, yes, that's a traditional dance because of the context it comes from. Um, there's an Igbo masquerade, for example, and this Igbo masquerade, it dances what the young people in the village do. So this, it, this masquerade has been dancing what the young people do in the village. They've been doing that for 500 years. So, in the 80s, somebody saw this masquerade dancing breakdance, um, which is an African-American form. And they said, oh, the masquerade has now become contemporary. And some people were arguing, no, this masquerade is still traditional. Because in the traditional uh, system, the aim of this masquerade is to dance what the young people are doing. And the young people right now are doing breakdance. So the masquerade is dancing breakdance. It's still doing a traditional function, finish. So when you have that kind of complexity of understanding of tradition, then what is contemporary? You know? So the view of what contemporary is and modern is, we need more discussion about this. And I think we need to write more about what we are doing from these perspectives. And what I see now, which I think is extremely healthy, is that we acknowledge that we're working in a theatrical situ situation and we're moving our work through different spaces and contexts. So sometimes we're in a theatre, sometimes we're in a compound, in a house performing. And when we go into these different spaces, we know we encounter different perceptions and different audiences. And we're saying, how do we communicate with these people? In what way do I communicate with them that I blow away stereotypes and they actually listen and see and perceive what I'm trying to put across? And that's what dramaturgy is doing, and that's what artists like Olivier is doing. When they sit down and they think, how do I make this story communicate in a way that resonates, and that when you go home, you continue to think about it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for me.
Thank you very much. We're, we're going to, um, uh, I think we're going to take the picture out, but you can continue to listen. Yeah? Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually, I think I'm going to just pick right up from uh, Fumi's uh, challenge to think about this work, but um, I'd love to hear um, from our guests. Uh, first, if you have whatever reaction you have to the talk that Olivier gave and certainly the, the, the information and uh, framing uh, that Funmi just gave us, uh, especially about this idea of tradition and contemporary uh, and uh, what um, Olivier showed us in his work uh, engaging with uh, the contemporary and the traditional. Well, I'd, like to, I'd like to start out um, by doing the same thing that Olivier did and the sister did, um, and that's just acknowledging, you know, my ancestors and my family line. I think it's Im important for any of us who are connected to uh, the culture uh, of African tradition that we follow um, the linear, you know, and maybe the oscillatory uh, uh, movement, you know, uh, and spirit of the culture. So. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that my grandfather was in vaudeville. My, my grandmother was one of the first black Ford models. I came up in clothes, in clothing, and in art and music. Um, I started in music in, 1950, in 1955, glockenspiel, um, xylophone, piano, uh, first saxophone um, in, 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 um, in junior high school, went to music and art, wanted to become John Coltrane and Charlie Parker. That didn't happen. Um, <laughs> They made me play viola for, um, for uh, four years um, because I was a Brown versus Board ed education baby, transferred out of a Harlem schools, two of children in Harlem schools, went down to PS6, kids pulling up in schools and limousines, uh, going to the Met every day, seeing opera, uh, getting out of music and art, not knowing where I was going because I ceased to become a jazz musician, went into, into Lehman College and met my dance mother, Joan Miller, the first postmodern lesbian black choreographer who drove a red truck, uh, lived with Gwen Watson, you know, a classical piano uh, cellist, uh, and it completely stripped me of everything that I thought that I was supposed to be about. Um, so in, in my family, like my mother was a, was a, 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 a model um, that modeled hats. My grandmother was one of the first 1199, um, you know, local workers, and so that my construct of politic and art you know, and music and dance is something that informed my life. I was born in 1950, I'll be 70 next year. Um, thank you for not reading my resume. I appreciate that. Um, um, but as I listen to Olivier and I listen to the sister, and I, Carl and I come out of the same dance schools, Elio, uh, Alvin, Limon, Jose, but at the same time, I came out of the Chuck Davis mindset. Um, and so when I say acknowledging my ancestors, if it were not for all of these contemporary people in my life, uh, Louis Falco, Juan Antonio, Joan, Joan Miller, Paul Sansardo, and forming my life and my mindset and my career, combined with Baba Chuck Davis and Ibrahima Kamala from Guinea and, and Chao Sam from Nigeria and Yoruba culture and, 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 and ethnic culture and, and Senegalese and, and Wolof and, and Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire, you know, it, it, it's just, it's endless. We are all a composite of everything that we have experienced. There is nothing new under the sun, only new variations of a theme. So none of us can take credit, right, for creating something which is absolutely brand new. Because, excuse my vernacular, but there ain't shit that's brand new, right? Everything that we take a look at and we see is something that is inherited from something else. Uh, a very good friend of mine taught me one time that manure is a fertilizer, right? So that even though we run from manure and the stench and the smell of it, the actual reality of manure is that things grow and evolve and are reborn out of the negative and the dark things that we have, have experienced. So when I look, listen to you and I listen to the sister, it is your dark experiences, it is the metaphorically dark experiences, the things that you have gone through which have informed your life, which made you the choreographer and making the choreographer you are. I was very excited to see your work um, uh, and, and enjoy it. And so I will, uh, I'm not a ball player. I used to run track and swim. But I'm going to bounce past the ball to whoever wants to pick it up by simply saying that in, 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 in my work, and I think in all of our work, we are constantly battling, utilizing, 
uh, light and dark forces in order to find ways to heal our society and to heal ourselves. So these are things that we, that I know I have never stopped doing. I've been making dances since 1979, um, first with Chuck's company uh, and with Forces of Nature. And when I l listen to the things that you were doing, I have to say that your journey is my journey, is Carl's journey, is Charmy's journey, was Louis's journey, was my dance mother's journey. We are all on the same journey. We are trying, we are seeking for something we will never find, which is the perfect ballet, right? Which is the golden ballet, which is the platinum ballet. And how do we take that energy and movement and use it to empower, first of all, ourselves, our audience, audiences, and, and, um, and the society at large? So um, I, I don't know where I'm going at 70 years old, but I'm still in the damn game. I'm still in the game, you know, I'm still searching, I'm still searching and still looking uh, and critics be damned <laughs> um, and I love critics. Uh, Jennifer was, Jenny Dunning was a, a great friend of mine and she would blast the hell out of me, you know, if I did something that she thought was incorrect. But she was a different kind of critic and that when she gave me the negative note, she also sought, looked for, you know, the, the, the golden thread in the work and she acknowledged both of those things, the light and the dark energy. So I, I would throw out to the panel, in addition to the questions that you write about, you know, how do we here come together in order to heal and improve and give ourselves, well, we'll never find, um, uh, we'll never find complete bliss, but we'll get as close to it as possible. How do we do that with our art? And I know I've been in search of the miraculous uh, I will have been in the arts for 50 years um, next year. Uh, I'm still in search of. I have not found the answer because there is no the answer. Right? Somebody want to pick that uh, question up? Or go someplace else. <laughs> or, go, <laughs> or we can go someplace. <laughs> or what, would care to um, uh, engage with the question of of well, I, one of the questions that, that I have has to do with um, the fact that this is such a large field, so diverse, um, and all these different ways of trying to engage with it. Um, Andre, you are engaging at the moment in a, in a, a project about Afrofuturism. What, what does that mean for you and, and, and how you approach your work? Uh, for me, um, the project that Rosamond was dramaturging on, uh, Same Space, uh, for those that weren't here to see the film, it's uh, starting with a consideration of what really this diaspora is. Um, and I, I'm, I think one of the articulations within the Afrofuturism series is really delineating diaspora and African continent because they're two different things. The Middle Passage birth and was a death, uh, if I can bring in the words of Saidia Hartman, something else. So the considerations then of modernity itself and tradition, if we can bring that back, really in this creation within another hemisphere of a diaspora did something else. I, I, I'm so thank you, Fumi, for really articulating the function of tradition on the African continent. In the diaspora, it is something else. It is not what, what we have, what I was born into, born into Chicago, Illinois, with lineage from Haiti and the, the Southern United States, Mississippi, is not what Burkina Faso and tradition is doing there. And I think that is something that is completely misunderstood, especially, thank you as well, Fumi, when you're saying in markets, of that delineation. It is not the same thing. And the articulation and nuances and complexities of that are vastly, vastly uh, uh, expanding, especially across time in itself in this diaspora. So if we're gonna look at tradition, let's say we can uh, articulate the tradition of the, the Yanvalu of Haiti. Well, uh, uh, and very similar to as Fumi is articulating, the tradition of Yon Valu and its context 
are we thinking of the Yom Valu pre-Haitian revolution, while the Haitians were still enslaved? Or are we thinking about the articulation of Yom Valu as a modern and continuing practice, if we can also then say the Gede practice and, uh, and those? Yet when we look at, if we go to uh, the ballet dances that exist also within the Caribbean, yeah? So then we can then now understand that delineation between that and the United States within the diaspora. And what this idea of tradition is doing. Yeah, so for, the, for me with my Afrofuturism work, it was immediately, I had to go back to the ring shout and understand what its function was. But then again, in bringing back Fumi into the room, saying, okay, but wait a minute, how have we been able to transform this idea and this real practice of ring shout through these contexts over time? So yes, in the sense that we have this ring and this counterclockwise um, uh, uh, um, movement of bodies, we have these timekeepers on the outside yeah, in the robbing of drums of, of African bodies, specifically on the United States, not even within the islands of the Caribbean. But so how did we then remix that over time? Okay, feet on top of washboards, hands on washboard, uh, soap boxes, and um, uh, um, a stick or a baton, as it's also called. We have this call and response, this gesture. Okay, then how do we re-articulate that over time? Okay, so then we move into uh, the early 20th century and we have Duke Ellington and Chip Webb and, and, and Cab Calloway and their big band and we have this hidey, 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 hey. Uh, this call, yeah, this call and response again. We have this band, Timekeeper on the outside. All of a sudden this ring on the inside with some Lindy Hoppers and people going back and forth. Then we bring it now to the mid 1970s, early 80s. Yeah, we have all of a sudden Cool Herc realizing, ah, if I extend this breakbeat of James Brown they're gonna stop fighting. Okay, great, so we're gonna, then they create this thing called this cipher and all of a sudden we've remixed again the function and the tradition that's rooted in the ring shout over time. And now it serves a different purpose. Yes, it is an extension of what was birthed and also died along the Middle Passage, but now its function is doing something and articulating something completely different in this hemisphere for us than it is as well for uh, uh, Olivier and others from the African continent. I can, I'll, I'll come back to some other things later in, in terms of context and time and how another problem I have is time capsuling tradition and this idea of modernity and especially of, of Africanisms both in this hemisphere and on the African continent, especially pre-contact with European as if that was somehow kind of an entrapment or pre, uh, or during the antebellum pre-emancipation period of uh, this hemisphere for uh, Africanized bodies. Thank you. Um, um, actually, Rosamond, would you mind talking about your, your work, but also how you connected with Andre and how you all work together? On that? Sure, well, I think, you know, I think dramaturgy is something very interesting. And what I, one of the things that I've heard that I think um, is happening with Africana dance dramaturgy is that it's not just happening in the studio, right? And so when you talk about having pre-show conversations, post-show conversations, Andre had pre-show conversations before his piece, um, and I think that a lot of that is to do with context, right? Because the pieces can exist in many different ways. And so the two, the two pieces that I showed, I showed the works in progress, and so Tiny Whiny was shown in Antioch College in Ohio. Pause. <laughs> Where almost no one in the room, I think, actually knew that song or knew the, the, kind of, the kind of movement traditions that I was drawing on, but still got something from it and you can hear the response, mm -hmm. right? And then when Candace Thompson invites me to do that piece as part of Caribbean Dance Collective in Brooklyn, right? It's a very kind of different, um, different kind of uh, interaction that's happening. Um, and when I think about, you know, Andre's work is often called experimental, right? But, but, but people who are familiar with um, Caribbean dance will see some of the Haitian movements that are there, as well as what is kind of called experimental. Um, and I think also, you know, I was thinking about this Toni Morrison quote from Sula, um, how wonderful it is to have a friend of your mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes dramaturgy in the best sense 
is when you can have a friend of your mind to help you make the piece what it is meant to be. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, and, and so um, actually what you were just, sorry, were you going to respond? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, what, you, what you were just saying about context um, made me think about, uh, Olivier, what you were saying about your dancers and how you go back to Burkina to, to, to dance, to work on your pieces because of that particular context. And I wondered when did that occur to you that you needed to do that? Were you here in the States trying to make the work and it didn't work? Or? Mm. Um, it's actually around when I met you in, in Los Angeles years ago. <laughs> uh, um, I made a work. Um, it's actually, I kind of feel, um, I'm a bit, I have a mixed feeling about this work because it's my work that gave me the, my most important award, which is the Lester Horton Award. But at the same time, when I look at what I'm doing today, I think I'm doing better. But, you know, uh, but the, what, what messed me up in my head is I made this work uh, called Yamayama uh, Manamanakono, which means disorder uh, within order. And it was about also uh, uh, a political assassination in Burkina Faso. Not that all my work is about politics, no. But this one was, you know, the the brother of the president who was more powerful than the president. You know, we can see what is happening here right now too. Uh, and, and who ordered the assassination of, of, of a journalist, the, most, the smartest journalist of our country, who was investigating the murder of the driver and the disappearance of the gardener of the brother of the president. So which means it happened that some money was lost and then, and then the brother of the president came and took them to the to the special uh, uh, secret services, and then pop, 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 I need my money, murder, one disappeared. Then he was investigating that. Then he was assassinated with, he, he was assassinated, he was driving to his, uh, to, he has this uh, farm, he was driving there, and he was you know, ambushed and killed him, his brother, and all of his friends in the car. Burn, disappeared. Only one nomad guy, full of men, was walking in the bush who saw that he's only one person. And so all the military who did it and they were able to accept that these people did it, but they won't see who did that. They all went to jail and they all got sick and jail and kind of died. <laughs> Everybody died. Everyone was in jail and they're all like the best secret service agents, tough friends. They all died. So which means disappearance, right? So no one is talking. That fuller guy, we don't know where he is today. We have no idea. So I was like, okay, I live in the United States. Land of the free and, uh, and the brave. I don't know. I'm not sure. But sorry, yeah. <laughs> so not in 2019. <clears throat> but uh, don't take this bad. Uh, so um, vote next year. So so what happened is I told myself, okay, I could, I have an opportunity to make something about this piece, uh, about this situation, because people, students talked about it, and a lot of them were in jail or disappeared. So I made a piece about this event because everyone knew it was the body of the president, but no one wanted to talk about it. Mm. We know, but we don't say it. You know, we know what is happening with the impeachment. We know what it is, but we can't technically, well, same situation. So I made the piece in Los Angeles at the Ford Amphitheater. It went really well, great reviews, everything, award, thank you. But then my mother told me, do not bring the piece home. If you bring the piece home, I may be going to visit you at the cemetery. So it got to a level that I was putting myself in danger because I badly wanted this piece to be seen home. So I had my friend Willie, who was in the piece with me, uh, and then uh, and I took a lot of dancers uh, uh, with many different races in the piece, uh, Asians and, and Caucasians and, uh, and, and, and uh, Africans. And the music was very inspired by Afro blues music. So then, I had a hard time with the authenticity of the piece and, and, and how I approached the story, no matter how much people appreciated it. But I needed to face myself in the mirror and told me like, okay, it's, it's a standing ovation really means that everybody who stood up really know why they stood up? Or no, I'm, I, this is serious because 
my last piece, you know, every night I was fortunate. Every night people was, had a standing ovation. One night, people didn't stand up. It was at Princeton. My dancer was like, what did we do? It was a weird audience. I was like, wait a minute. Then it was the night where I had the best feedback ever. People came to me with details. I was like, wow. They really understood the piece. They really actually liked it. And I said, maybe sometimes people stand up because other people stood up, right? So, no, seriously. Then I told myself that I need to redo that piece home. One, financially, I couldn't take people, but I needed to make this. So I uh, went home. My mother completely gave me the advice not to even make the mistake to make that work. So I started making all the work home, and, I, and it was by mistake I got home like that. And then and I started saying, wait a minute, I'm cooking this better when I'm home. My sauce has different flavors. It's really cooking. I'm not, I don't need to go to... Uh, 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 you know, a Chinese supermarket to find African spices. I have it right there. So I cooked it better. And so from there, by the fact that I wanted to make that story home, and then my mother said no, and I made another piece, then I realized that I, I was cooking my sauce better back there because, you know, the ingredients were there, and, and right there, the market was right at my door. And that's what it, how it happened. And it's just by like that. And I never made that piece because that president was out after. Anyway, so that's how I got home, and that is why I started, you know, and I got used to that sweetness of the, of the spices, and I couldn't uh, run away from it. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sometimes my, my, my wife, she says to me all the time that when, when I get on panels like this, I have a tendency to speak in philosophical generalities because I'm trying to say things that will relate to the entire audience rather than my own experience. Um, so let me just do something quickly, just anecdotal. Chuck's company was in Festac in Nigeria in 1977. Uh, the company had performed uh, Lamba and Fletta Kodaba, you know, some Guinea for uh, Sosene uh, dances for Kaki Lambe, um, um, Sunu. And uh, the company was back in the compound, and Hamadou, who was a director, you know, brilliant musician, this is way before Mama Diketa took over in the Jimbe, became the Jimbe phenomenon that he was. He was only 13 at the time. But Famadou said to uh, Balagoon, you know, you, you, Chuck's company just came and did with 13 people what we do with 60 people, you know. <laughs> you came, you had four drummers and like about, you know, eight or nine dancers, and you did this entire, you know, concert. But we were changing musicians, we had 30 people here, we changed, you know, we moved from this, this group to that group. How did you do this thing? So, you know, the, the conversation happened. And he said, well, you know, he said, um, and Shami told me to make sure I said this because this opens the door for dramaturgy and the construct of somebody who came up in the African diaspora, but also as an American, as a part of Western civilization, looking to how to bond and bring together the past, the ancient and the new. He said, you know, you do, you do it so very well. You do Kakilambe very well. You do Fretta Koloba very well. This is good, but uh, we know this because we taught you that. We came over here in 1970, you know, in 71, and we worked with Chuck's company. They kind of took us, you know, you know as in, and they kind of raised us. And in later years, Ibrahim Kamala did the same thing. He said, but um, what is your story? We don't need you to come over here to Africa and, and dance our stories. It's good that you respect us and honor us. But we want to know what you got to tell us. What was your experience? Why you don't take the djembe, the sangba, the dundun, you know, the other drums, and tell us the African-American traditions. Tell us the stories of the diaspora. What has empowered you in your life? And if you bring that home here, not only do you show us that you are a brother and sister, you know, but that you show us that we are truly one people who can take the creative construct of what we do and create something, create something which is of value to you, which will be new for us and of value to us. Shifted my entire life. My entire focus became shifted. And then I realized that coming out of our tradition in the diaspora, we are storytellers. Now there's a beef, right, in the modern dance world. Things need to be abstract, right? Don't tell the story, you know what I'm saying? Because you treat the audience like they're stupid, right? So you don't want to, 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 to insinuate or say to the audience, you're not intelligent. 
So you create this abstract construct or theme. Don't worry about a narrative. Don't worry about dramaturgy, right? You know, create images and allow people to create their own idea of what you're saying. Extremely valid, right? Except that we are a story people, right? Our mothers, our fathers, our, you know, the people that we come up with, they have told us stories. Even we tell stories in the abstract. It's still a story, right? We are still inspiring someone to learn and understand something, or, or, or at least at, at times, this is something that we want to do. I love abstraction because I, you know, we all have come up in a contemporary society. But there is something also powerful to a person looking at something and saying to you, I was able to create my own idea, but I got what you were trying to say to me. I understood it, you know. Or I can take what you said, right? And I can create something which is valid for me, that empowers me. So I think, again, it's about both things, right? Every time I listen to you, you're telling a story, man. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you are filled with stories, right? You know, you're empowered by stories. Yes, go ahead, bounce pass. I, I think what, mm -hmm. what's also interesting about what you're saying in terms of abstraction, right, is mm -hmm. that most of blackness is abstraction to people who aren't black. Right. So the piece, you know, ha is, there's a piece called <laughs> Hashtag Say Her Name, and I perform it at Judson Theater. And um, there are about four black people there. And all of these people come up to me afterwards and say, so what was that list? What was that piece about? <laughs> so it was pure abstraction for them. Whereas, again, when I performed it in Bed-Stuy, it was not abstract. Uh, yes, I know. Charm Charm you know, and I would love to get uh, your response to this. Well, in particular, you are uh, a member of Forces of Nature, and you have been working with, working with Abdel and experiencing these things that he's talking about, and I'd love to hear your response to this work. Um, yeah, so I think what this conversation makes me think of is what Rosamond was saying about um, what gets seen as experimental and uh, like the discourses that surround formalism and abstraction and who gets to be abstract in certain ways. But so much of that is about who's able to see a formal innovation, right? So if you take Sosene and then you put it in a seven and there's usually in a six, that's a formal experimentation. But you have to know that it's in a six and you have to be able to hear that it's in a seven, you know, or what you're doing. And I think you too, being musicians, who choreograph have this very interesting, where, you, if, where you're doing now with Sunu and Lamban, and there's one more, bringing them together. Or what you say, if you're able to see the Haitian references in Andre's work and understand Yambalu in one context or the variations of Yambalu that have come, right? That are, yes, of tradition, but innovation within that tradition. Um, and I don't think that usually gets seen as experimental. When of course it is. Can I can I can I veggie back off of what you just said? Okay, no, because we right, uh, veggie back, right? Um, do do do, da da do da do do do, one two three four, da 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 do go do, ding da da do da do da do go do, as opposed to a seven, do go do, da do go do da do go do da do go do da do go da do go do da go da do go, right? Why a seven? Why not a seven? Why does it have to be limited to a six or a four? Why, why do people think that all African tradition is a four and a six and a one or a two? That our experience here has taught us in terms of music that we can go any place that we want to go with this. So if we add on, on to it the context of the message that we're trying to, to explain, right, or to share with someone, and then we create within this experiment a new language of sound and a new language of movement, then we've taken the tradition and done what, um, what was it Fumi that said that, right? Yes, we've, we've, we've reinvented tradition. We've taken tradition and pushed the boundaries of tradition and taken it further. Even with what you said, Jan Ballou has been this recurring construct in my life that started out with Dunham, you know, with Dunham technique. But in addition to 
just the physical form, it was also the metaphysical form, right? It was Dambala and Aida Wedo. It was the serpent. It was the zoomorphic symbolism of why a snake was looked at and revered, not turned into a god or worshiped, but why we looked at the powers of the forces of nature and emulated those things within dance and within dance form and structure. It's the same thing that continues to happen as we reinvent the culture. And, the, and, and, and I want to give this back to you by saying that all of us are cultural reformers through our arts. We are all looking at ways and means to, to do what a culture is supposed to do. A good friend of mine said, when you go to the doctor, the first thing they do when they're trying to find out what's wrong with you is they take a culture, right? So it's not just artistic, but your culture is your living DNA, your memory, your history, something which is timeless, whether we want to say it's the primal screen, things that go back as far as, 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 the, eye, as the eye can see. So as artists, this is something that we are, we are born to do. We are born to reinvent and make culture and do it within a traditional sense, but also do it within a contemporary context too. I saw you, I saw you kicked a breath, that's a pregnant pause. Somebody else is supposed to be talking. <laughs> well, actually what I would like to do is <laughs> offer our audience an opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> um, so, um, do we have any questions uh, from our audience? for our uh, guests. I think we have a microphone. Here, actually, take mine. Oh, no, there's one. We have a microphone. We have a microphone there. Um, we can take a moment. We've had a, a lot of, uh, we've had a lot to take in, uh, in terms of uh, subject matter, in terms of um, frameworks of, of the modern and contemporary, the traditional. Yes, we have a question over here. Thank you, thank you for such a wonderful panel and uh, sharing with us these insights. And Olivier, I saw your performance at under the crossing, under the crossing the line. Or it was a, such a wonderful performance. But uh, I was really taken by the extraordinary dancers that you had, and you getting your dancers from Burkina Faso. Um, just wondering if you could say something about um, the role that dance plays in that community, and perhaps the training of dancers. Where do you, how do they? Where did those extraordinary dancers, how did they develop their skills and, and their connection to dance? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> beautiful thing is uh, uh, Abdel Salam just came back from Burkina. I think he's so stuff and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're bringing Burkina Faso to Dance Africa for the first time. It's yes, never, it's, so never it's been a very dance exciting. That was it. Right. For the first time. So um, <clears throat> in Burkina Faso, we have... Uh, is CDC. CDC is Choreography Development Center. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's from a French system. Uh, it's actually the only CDC in the continent. You have a lot of amazing places like Ecole de Sable in, in, in Senegal with uh, uh, Germain, Akouni, but CDC is only in Burkina for now. So um, it was created by Salia Sanu and Seydou Boro, absolutely amazing choreographers since the early 90s that worked on tour with Mathilde Monnier from France. And so uh, CDC has a, a, a certificate, sadly it's not a diploma yet, but it's a three years uh, full, uh, almost like going to the university, like full time uh, in order to get that certificate. And so I'm a resident artist for CDC. All my work have been you know, uh, 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 taken by CDC to create there. So in order to be a resident artist, you also have to teach be part of the faculty. So the fact that I was part of the faculty since 2006 at CDC, every time I go home, a lot of them, I saw them as you know beginners, but in three years what they got at CDC was more than my generation, what we have done for like 10, 6, 10, 12, 14 years. They were lucky that this existed. So yes, they, had the, they, they got the traditional, the music, uh, and they also, the intellectual side about, you know, how do you do a production, how, almost like someone doing the MFA, how do lighting, design, everything, but then a lot of training and improvisation. Because we believe that if they start doing postmodern and other techniques, you are becoming somebody else. How do you understand how to make? So through understanding improv really well, this is also how I work with my company, is like then that's when the hybridness come. You, you know, because they already have a certain strong technique in African and other uh, uh, dances, but we 
put a lot of emphasis in the improvisation and how do you do contact improv and then then they do also more than technique but we put more accent into that side so that they understand how do you create instead of trying to be someone else that they're going always going to beat you how do you make how do you become unique so that's through cdc that i was able to teach and see some people grow in three years and then after three years, I'm doing other stuff. Two years after that, he's dancing for this guy, for this guy. I'm like, uh, let's talk. That's how I get uh, my team uh, from CDC. And, that, and, and we're very, very fortunate, honestly. The training is very high in Burkina because of CDC. Hello, thank you for this amazing round table. Uh, my question will be to Charmian mainly, but please feel free to also contribute, all of you. Uh, I would love to hear more about this um, experimental uh, approach, depending on how audience relates to it, whether the audience knows it uh, or not. If you could expand more on that, that would be great. I'm thinking, um, for instance, Reggie Wilson, addresses it by giving a lecture performance before the performance. So I guess that's one way of educating the audience to a degree to give that ground for experimentalism. Uh, obviously, you're laughing. <laughs> I want to address that right now. But, yeah, um, what so other uh, strategies I, are there? So I'm gonna, I want to address that and I want to address what Abdel was saying earlier about experimental and contemporary performance. And in, this, in the idea of the black tradition in the United States and diaspora. I had a piece in 2011, it's online as well, it was called um, I Want to Show You Something Beautiful. Um, it, it's a, it, it, m most of my work does examine black masculinity and its complexities and what it's doing, uh, specifically here in the States. Uh, I performed it at Dixon Place, um, the late Niles Ford, um, who was also a mentor of mine, um, um, commissioned me to do this uh, performance. Um, I was really grateful to Niles. In the performance, um, um, I, I'm kind of I'm gonna kind of explain the work. Um, uh, I put on uh, Blue Monday's new uh, um, um, Blue Monday from our uh, New Order. You know, the how does it feel? Do do now again the association of that. How does it feel to treat me like you do? When you do, yeah, so how that new wave, you know, uh, uh, the nouvelle vague of the 80s with me, this black performer, just going in a, in, a, in a loop, yeah? But again, that's complete, but do you get it? Yeah? Then, you know, and I, I haven't done a, you know, a, Tommy, a John Carlos, Tommy Smith black power salute yet at all. And then this part about masculinity, uh, you know, about relationships. So then this Al Green comes on and I just slowly kind of go upstage and I start stirring this pot and we hear uh, Brother Al and I just pull the, it, and out of it comes grits and some grits just falls over me. Now from an African, now, now Abdel is laughing because he knows exactly what that is. But now that is the most, now for your context, you will just be like, well, this is so experiment. You know, of course, the white people are coming up to me after. What was that? Was that this, this substance on your body, this white thing, and then your black skin? Abdel is laughing because we understand what does that mean? Me pouring hot grits on myself. Right, exactly. Exactly. And now I'm going to bring back Fumi again when Fumi is talking about the context and references and the metaphorical objects and the semiotic understanding of what that is. You're laughing because you get it. Now, that's the most experimental shit ever. But that is the blackest thing ever. Me pouring hot grits on my damn self. You know you're laughing right now because that's the blackest thing ever. And for a black man to do that to himself in the United States is hilarious. I'm sure many of you white people have no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm, and, and I'm going to let you reference and figure out what that is. But that is, in, 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 in the extension of Reggie Wilson, that is black experimental performance that goes and shatters this idea of narrative, of complacency, and, 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 also, and, and even uh, this idea of, of, of fixated uh, uh, recognition. So that is what we're saying in this sense of context of time, of experimentalism, is and has been happening in the lineage of uh, um, Baba Elio Pomare, uh, 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 Mother Blondell Cummings, for years. 
Mama Joan Middle for years, yes. If we look at, the, if we're going if, uh, to bring in the carnival itself, carnival, like that is a key, uh, the, the, the effigy and the, the satire of the effigy itself is an extreme example of black experimental performance that for some people will be completely lost. Well, what the hell is going on? But then if you're in one context, wherever you are in New Orleans or wherever, you completely get it. So that's it. So it, it's it's really so again. It here in the the states, and in this hemisphere, some really different things are happening, and some uses are are happening. That, especially, and I'm going to bring this back to your question about the dancers in CDC, and in the European and in the Africanized context, institutions are built to preserve, protect, and promote the cultural fluency of dance works. Every artist here, as Abdel was explaining, through Rosamond, through Edison Weeks, through Candace, the, 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 ex, the, the, the very creation and notion of black dancing bodies is itself a, is a revolutionary statement that is actually anti-state. That is actually supposed to dismantle the state. There's no way the state could truly fund black bodies actually really articulating themselves because the true articulation of that is to actually dismantle the subjugation and the oppression of what is here. So it is literally impossible for a true sense of funding body, that, that's what I'm saying. This is why we have to understand this delineation of diaspora and an African continent. The funding of CDC coming from this model of a French conservatoire can actually fund and promote from a nationalized landscape. In this diaspora and hemisphere, Capoeira was outlawed. That was a dismantling of, of, of the, the, the segregation and, 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 and racist state of Brazil. Yeah, uh, you, you see what I'm saying? So, when, so those differences and delineations are extremely important when we're understanding the continuation and even development of, of dance in this hemisphere. As you're saying, of break dance. Sorry, I, you know, <laughs> so I, I can go on and on, but again, like, it, it's really important that we really articulate these differences. Thank you. Charmaine, Charmaine did you want to? Yeah, I, I just, in response to what you said about state funding, it, it makes me think of um, the Dance Mobile, which was state funded and it was part of this. Um, moment in the 60s, it was supposed to be like cool out funding, like riot prevention. And then of course what Elio Pomari did was stage blues for the jungle, which ends with the dancers staging a riot in the audience. <laughs> right? Like I love this kind of use of state funding, at, to your point. I think also, you know, what Rosamond said is pretty much it, right? The context, the reception, is it concrete because you know exactly what that is? You see those names, it's um, part of what concert dance is burdened with in this country at the very least is a history of modernism and the flip side of primitivism, right? They're mutually defining and that's the legacy we're living in. Thank you, John Martin, among others. He's not the only one, um, but what that, has, what that did is establish a timeline in which value is placed in the front, the vanguard, the innovative, the progressive, the original, that which has no connection to something that came before. Oh look, it's brand new. I can claim it as property and capitalism. I just made this up in the studio by myself. Of course, we've seen that, like that's completely not the case. Hello, Ruth St. Dennis. Um, <laughs> But that's the way that value has been discursively attributed. So experimentalism is in that forward thing where tradition is devalued and is attributed to, you know, um, white folks. And um, I'm talking about discursively, like dance criticism and writing dance history. Not like practically, right? Elio trafficked in abstraction, you traffic in abstract, every, you know, the things that Picasso abstracted were themselves trafficking in abstraction. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, um, abstraction doesn't belong to white people, but discursively it's attributed to white people because they occupy an abstract subject position. You know, so there's like that kind of distinction between is it artistic abstraction in which you're not literally telling a story or a narrative, or is it this other kind of weird function where you get to be valuable in a certain way because your example is a little bit complicates what I'm saying. <laughs> 
but I think that's the legacy that we inherit that becomes difficult with experimental, then there's one set of associations, and it's not Jan Velu. <laughs> yeah, we got a question here. Oh, and Fun, I think Funmi has a comment. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Thank you for the really rich discussion. Um, I just want to share some thoughts. Um, when Charmaine was talking about this timeline um, that has sort of become the timeline of concert dance that everybody sort of has to, it's a legacy everybody has to deal with. Um, so rightly said, um, when you talk about the black experience or the African experience, you're talking about a multitude of stories and that's why I really hear when Andre talks about the differences need to be said very clearly because people, what people are bringing to the stage are referencing different kinds of traditions, different histories, the objects mean different things in different places. So we have to think of a rhizomic way of telling our stories. And that's why I'm really up for the pre-show talk and the post-show talk discussions like this so that each artist can actually say, this is my positionality. And do not try and understand me by this Eurocentric timeline that starts, you know, with classicism and goes into postmodernism. That's one story. And we are cutting through that story and intersecting that story, you know, from different ways. So um, there needs to be a, a more open way of thinking about dance history and how different people get to the concert stage through different avenues. And I think we start needing to talk about stories in that way. And I think dramaturgy is sometimes operates like a map. If you can follow the dramaturgical structure of a piece, sometimes you get, you see the, the various um, tributaries that the dancer is bringing together. I also want to go back to something Andre is saying about talking about differences. Um, unless we talk about the difference between Africa and the diaspora, the conversation that goes on between Africa and diaspora cannot be fully understood. Mm -hmm. If they're just merged as one thing, then we lose the story of um, Olivier's father and his influ and the influences he had from African American um, performers that would be lost because they're one and the same thing. They're not one and the same thing. There was a dialogue there. Fela uh, Nicolas Mokuti was influenced very strongly about the, um, African American politics. There's been a dialogue here, so it's not one way. It goes across from Africa to America, America to Africa. And, and we have to honor the various, the variety and the complexity of the stories and make a historical space for them somehow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's the question of the evening, but yes, or comment. Well, it <laughs> isn't exactly a question. <laughs> there, there are a couple of just very brief comments I'd like to make. The first one is that thank you all so much for your, your insightful comments, your wonderful comments. Um, but you make me think of various things, but I'll be very brief about one or two of them. Um, I, I think I'd like to add to some of the comments that we also, when we're talking, especially when we're talking about, uh, let's say, just to sh for shorthand, black dance, Africana dance here in the United States, we're talking about a politics of tradition as well. We're talking about a politics of accommodation and of appropriation and all of those things. That's why in Fumi, tradition is seen so different. Uh, traditional dance is seen so differently here in the USA as opposed to in other places because there was that very long history of trying to assimilate, trying to point our feet and, and, and show along with this, uh, the stories that we were telling that we could also be classical, that we could also point our feet. And that's why we have that tension between telling stories and being abstract and all that and getting all that confused. Which brings me to the other point. Uh, we, uh, uh, Mr. Olivier, you reminded me of a, uh, that we're coming into a period now, and it's always been there, but now it's more prevalent, that we're questioning who defines the terms. So that's why now you can go back to your tradition, 
That's why now you can talk about putting uh, grits falling, uh, 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 being poured on you, and that is absolutely experimental. But then, if that were done in the 60s, who was defining the terms in the 60s? Who was saying what was postmodern and what was not postmodern? And by the way, postmodernism meant that you had to negate a certain blackness at the time. So uh, that's, that's just kind of the kind of things I'd like to add to what you said. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask everyone to thank our panel, thank our artists, everyone that has come to this conversation. I want to thank you all very much for being a part of this. We're going to have a little reception, a little wine and cheese and fruit afterwards, so stick around. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Funmi, for staying up uh, with us in the UK. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone.